Hi, this is David Davis, and I'm here with John Dickinson from SwiftStack. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Great, great. So today we're going to go a little bit deeper into how Swift and SwiftStack work. Right. So first off, we want to talk about the Swift API. Right. In, in a previous uh, segment, we talked about uh, Swift in general, an open, open source uh, project. Mm -hmm. It's a object store. Correct. And um, SwiftStack, you guys have created a commercial implementation of the Swift object store. Yeah, a management control plan that comes alongside of the OpenStack Swift storage engine. Okay, okay. So how does Swift in itself work? Right, so this, I love talking about this. Okay. Uh, it's really, this is kind of what I've been uh, living and breathing for the last several years. Uh, so the first thing that we have to start with is what does the Swift API look like? Mm -hmm. And when we know what that looks like, then we can see how that fits into the different pieces and what that looks like in a big deployment. So to start with, with the Swift API, uh, it's all HTTP based, so that means you can use standard HTTP uh, stat, uh, response codes and verbs uh, to talk to it, and you can use a, uh, you reference all of your data based on a URL. And so this is what a, an example uh, URL would look like. You know, you talk to your domain, you use the, you implement in the uh, actual version of the API, very consistent version here, but uh, it's always been V1. Uh, but the three big pieces of the Swift API are the count, the container, and the object. Okay. And so these are really just subdivisions of the overall namespace within Swift. An account stores a listing of all of your containers that you have and some aggregated metadata, like how many bytes do I have stored in this whole thing? How many objects mm -hmm. do I have? The container is similar in that it stores a listing of all of the objects and then it has some aggregated metadata, like how many bytes are in this particular thing. Now, all of these things can store custom metadata as well, so you could say, this container was created on Tuesday, or it contains all of my applications for my FUBAR app, or something like that. The object data is where, the object level, level is where the objects are actually stored. You don't nest accounts and containers, um, so it gives you a very flat namespace here, but the, um, the object is where your data is stored. So you may have a Swift, uh, an account on a Swift cluster and you're given an account endpoint. Inside of that you can create your images container and then you can upload all of your vacation photos into here and uh, then directly access those uh, simply with an HTTP git. You can do a listing of all the objects you have by doing a, a git to your, uh, object, uh, to your container itself and, okay. and return that back. So the way that uh, that bakes down into the actual logical components of Swift itself is that you've basically got two high-level pieces of Swift. You've got a proxy server and you've got the storage server. The proxy server is responsible for um, all of the client-facing communication in the cluster. All client requests come to the proxy server. And then the proxy server implements most of the Swift API and then it coordinates all the communication with the storage servers. With the storage servers, there's three kinds the account, container, and the object. So maps to the account, the container, and the object storage okay. nodes. And so these each are responsible for their, uh, their respective entity within Swift. Now, the really great thing about this design is that these are just the logical processes that are running. And if you need more, you can add more. So you can scale out, and it's, you know, it's highly modular design, you know, the Unix philosophy of do, do one thing and do it well, uh, means that if you need more client throughput, you can add more proxy servers. If you need more uh, storage space, you can add more object servers. And you can do those independently, so you can very very specifically tailor your Swift deployment to uh, your specific use case. And you don't have to have this kind of monolithic thing that looks the same for everybody, no matter what they're using it for. Okay, so for non-developers out there, yeah. you know, an API, having an API is a good thing. Right. You can communicate with that thing mm -hmm. in a standard method. Um, this is really not that different from an HTTP request exactly. to a web yeah. server. Uh, the proxy here is similar in concept to a, a web server. It's, it's a process receiving communication in and out. Exactly, speaking in HTTP. An external source. Okay. And then the storage servers down here, now is this a, uh, I guess you could have multiple of these on a physical box yes or for development inside a virtual machine if you were t doing some testing exactly right in okay. fact what an actual deployment would look like is is kind of like this so you you can have normally a, a, a full featured HA Swift cluster is going to have multiple proxy servers and talking to many storage servers okay now one of the great things about the fact that you've got this proxy server here is the fact that the storage uh, is going to be you know, completely private and uh, behind all of these authentication layers, which means that 
your, your clients, your, your mobile phone that's using the Swift cluster can talk directly to the storage cluster. What this means is when you're building out your, your application, you know, the next greatest uh, mobile phone app, you don't have to scale out your, uh, your, your, your web front end application architecture just to, um, just to meet the needs for your storage engine. Uh, you can talk directly to the storage engine and the storage engine itself, Swift can offload some of the hard problems of storage for you. Okay. So in a real cluster, you've got these processes of the proxy servers, the account servers, the container servers, the object servers, the other, uh, the ba other back-end components. Those are just processes running on a machine someplace. Mm -hmm. And you can deploy those all on one box or you can scale it out into something else. And so a Swift cluster, kind of, kind of this part right here, is going to have, you know, the proxy servers talking to the different storage servers. Mm -hmm. All the communication comes here. Okay. There's obviously a lot more that goes into a deployment. You've got to worry about identity management with authentication. Mm. You've got to integrate that into uh, your existing uh, infrastructure. You've got to deal with load balancing on top of your proxy servers and how do you actually route this, this stuff uh, evenly. You could do uh, everything from round robin DNS to commercial things like F5s and A10s and you know, open source things. Uh, it just The point is um, you, that this is a component that has to come in. Uh, you've got questions about management, you know, alerting, monitoring, configuration. Mm -hmm. You know, these kind of pieces that come around it is where SwiftStack comes in and provides a lot of value to uh, the OpenStack Swift engine uh, itself. Okay, so I'm on my mobile phone. Right. Uh, I'm in an application. I'm talking to some application server that mm -hmm. I'm not pictured here. I click on a music file or a video right. file. That mobile phone is going to talk directly. It's going to authenticate, perhaps, uh, talk directly to a proxy server, and then just very quickly and efficiently pull out that directly file. from the Swift cluster itself and yeah the proxy server so it doesn't have to uh, send that internally through you don't have to scale out your network for your app server because you've already built that out for your storage server and I'm completely flexible here really in, in how I design it, how I design these how I place mm -hmm. these storage servers across multiple physical servers or two physical servers or uh, even perhaps geographically or yeah absolutely I also want to ask you about failure what if one of these you yeah, know, goes down. Well, that's a, uh, the failure question is a really good question and how you build this stuff out. So let me talk about the data placement and okay. that'll really inform you know, what happens when you have failures. Okay. So I'll uh, sketch that a little bit here. Um, the important point about Swift is that uh, today it's a replicated system, which means that if you send uh, some data, you'll say you're going to store an image, mm -hmm. uh, then it's going to store multiple copies of that image. Uh, that provides you both with high availability uh, in case of something going down, but also very high durability, uh, so you don't have to worry about a particular uh, piece of hardware failing and causing you problems with your data. So, so if I have to store multiple copies, how is that efficient? How is that efficient? <laughs> well, it's, um, it really has to do with um, what is the cost of losing your data? How efficient is it to store just one thing? Right. And especially when you're doing this at scale. Uh, if you look at something tradition more traditional like let's do a RAID 6 volume of something like this. Mm -hmm. Now what happens when you have one box, I'm going to put a RAID card behind it and I'm going to use you know, a couple dozen, um, yeah, two ter even just small two terabyte drives uh, on 24 servers and you put a RAID 6 volume on that. You've got some major problems if you have any sort of failure in that. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you very quickly reach the end of uh, usefulness on scaling out those. So what's your answer? You start adding more. And what you end up with is these carved off silos of, mm -hmm. of storage that are very hard to uh, expand. By doing replicas, you can fill up the cluster evenly and you can take advantage of the direct attached hard drives. So here's how this works within Swift. And, and when we're storing multiple copies, right. I think the important point is you're not storing them on multiple EMC SANs that cost $100,000 each. Not at all. You're, you're storing, storing them on across multiple commodity Hard drives. Hard drives. And servers. Okay. You may maybe just some JBODs uh, from you know, Dell, HP, Supermicro, whatever you like to use there. Um, just use some uh, commodity hard drives, okay. commodity uh, servers uh, that you can use. And no the, RAID controllers even? Um, it depends on your particular use case. Sometimes okay. you might want a RAID controller for a battery backed cache okay. uh, to protect against some power failures, yeah. but you absolutely don't want to use RAID. You don't need Swift. RAID for the redundancy? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Okay. Because here's how Swift does that. Um, all the replicas are placed according to a hierarchy of uh, your failure domains. The first failure domain is your hard drive. They fail all the time, so you've got to be able to get around to that. So you want to make sure you have uh, multiple, you have more than one copy that are on different hard drives. Servers also can fail, and mm -hmm. drives are attached to servers. So it would be really great if you could have those multiple uh, copies placed on different servers. 
Okay. You may actually group your servers into some sort of availability zone of a single failure domain like a rack is behind a single power supply or single type of rack switch. That can fail. Mm -hmm. you need, it would be really great if you can put that on multiple things behind multiple failure domains. And then even beyond that, you can have the groups of zones in uh, geographically uh, distinct regions. So here's kind of how that works. If you've got the region at the top, you may have a couple of zones in there. Inside of that, you've got a couple of servers and inside of each of those servers, you've got lots of hard drives. Yeah. Uh, so what happens is if you're storing three replicas for your data inside of Swift, the way that it's going to be placed is it's going to ensure, it's going to place those three replicas as uniquely as possible across this hierarchy. So that you're going to make sure you have it on different servers in different zones uh, and even if available, different regions. So in this particular example, we've got one region with two, uh, two zones and a lot of different uh, drives plugged into different servers. So we're going to first make sure it's on different servers, I mean, different hard drives. And now, here's your failure uh, pattern. Hard drive died. What happens? You can still have very high availability and durability because you still have your, uh, without having to use something like RAID, uh, because you still have these other two copies up. Now, if a server itself failed, you know, it was the server that went down, not just that. In that case, uh, you've still got, you're still protected all the way up. And uh, that provides you with some really great, uh, that's where you get some of your efficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not so much on efficiency on the, on the uh, how many bytes are stored on disk, but it's, let's actually make this usable and uh, you know, more important than uh, storing uh, the bytes on disk. A lot of times it's the, uh, making that av highly available. Uh, you have your data, you need it right now, and you can't have downtime. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to do this. Swift works around these failures automatically with very little operator interaction. So that's where you get a lot of your benefits in running a Swift cluster. Fascinating. What about uh, multiple regions, if you had? Right. These are sites, I'm guessing? Right. Or they so could be sites? Generally, uh, the, the way things are deployed is the zone is going to have a, a really performant network between multiple zones, mm -hmm. generally inside of a single data center. or potentially inside of a, a multiple data centers in a single data center. Mm -hmm. Something low latency, high throughput, things okay. like that. A region, and uh, Swift supports uh, geographically distinct clusters, so you can, uh, regions generally have an expensive network connection. And that may be cost, that may be latency, that may be low throughput, something like mm -hmm. this. But it is absolutely possible to build a Swift cluster today that has uh, uh, data stored both in Europe and APAC and the United States all at the same time, and uh, you get some really great stories with that. There's two, region, two uh, reasons, uh, two really big use cases for using the multi-region support. The first and kind of the default thing that people talk about is just a DR story. Mm -hmm. If one region goes down, I still need to be able to flop over and use the other one right now. Yeah, so and what about latency? So, well, uh, that, that's the other big <laughs> problem is I want to be able to have access to the closest region because I yeah. don't want to have a request from London go all the way to my LA office. I wanted to go to my Paris office. Yeah, like I've heard about CDNs on the internet exactly. for web content, exactly. globally distributed web so that's, content. So that's the uh, fundamental idea behind CDNs, okay. which is a footnote actually integrate exceptionally well into Swift. <laughs> uh, I've done that at scale a couple of different times. Uh, the, uh, with the Swift storage engine itself, one thing you can do is you can have these multiple active-active storage regions request flowing to both of them, and the Swift system is intelligent enough to uh, service the requests from the closest location, oh. which means that you can have access for, you can be reading data in Europe from your Europe location, and you can be reading the data from the same time from Australia, from your Australian location, but it's the same logical cluster, and uh, both regions are helping each other ensure that the data is durable and available. Fascinating. It's great. It's really exciting. Really incredible stuff. Well, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. For, for more information, you can visit SwiftStack.com.